In the early days of computing, things were far from easy. The processor and the memory it could deal with at any one moment consisted of hot thermionic valves, which acted as electronic switches. If one failed, the program crashed. Turn the machine off and all the data disappeared. Ever since computers were invented, everything they do has been based on the ability to store bits of information using those electronic switches. It took two of these valves to store just one bit of information. As eight bits make up one byte or one character, 16 valves were needed to store it. To hold a stream of bits while they were being processed and so cut down on the number of valves, early machines used things called delay lines, either mercury columns or as here coils of wire into which sound or stress waves were sent. A bit would be sent in at one end at the speed of sound and be read at the other if it was needed. If not, it was fed in to go around again. Another invention which helped the machine store information as it worked was the magnetic drum. It spun round and rather like a disk drive, information could be recorded on its surface and read back by these heads. This one can hold just four kilobytes of information. Using this kind of working memory, commercial computers appeared in the mid-50s. One of the earliest business computers in Britain was LEO, the Lions Electronic Office. Used in the mid-1950s by Lions tea shops and other organisations like the Ford Motor Company to do their payrolls. It was the beginning of the mass use of the computer for data processing, without which big business today simply couldn't operate. This first generation machine had thousands of hot valves, many of which had to be changed as they burnt out. For an hour a day, Leo belongs to its engineers for maintenance and testing. The voltage, normally kept to the operating figure, is made to fluctuate. Any valve or other component which can operate in such conditions is certainly fit for another 24 hours useful life. And if it cannot, then now is the chance to change it. Information about salaries, for example, was fed into the computer using punched cards. Preparing these cards was one of the most appalling jobs ever invented, and now happily just about gone. And information could be saved on the external or backing store, generally punched paper tape, for feeding into the machine again. Both the program and the data was fed in from these cards or tape. A new form of memory device for the inside of the machine came along in the 50s, core memory, tiny magnetic rings threaded by wires. In this picture, you can see the construction. Each magnetic core is capable of storing one bit, depending on whether it's magnetized one way or the other. Its drawback was that in reading the memory, you had to change the way that individual cores were magnetized. This destroyed the data, and so it had to be reset. Core memory, though, was fast and reliable. And incidentally, it was non-volatile, switch the machine off, and the data was still there. Because they're so reliable, they're still being used here in the studios at Television Center to store information about the lighting. Stacks of these cores made up something like this, the 1960s equivalent of the 16K RAM, or about one and a half pages of our phone book. Fortunately, in the 1960s, the transistor took over, but it still took two of these to store one bit of information. So computers were still large, though they were more reliable and made use of the new printed circuit boards. From this complex neatness stems a computer of the second generation which offers forward-thinking organizations a comprehensive data processing system at low cost. Here then is the 1301. With fast data handling based on a megacycle pulse rate, large internal storage capacity based on immediate access core stores and drum backing stores, Comprehensive magnetic tape facilities with full error detection are available and there is a choice between two magnetic tape systems. A high-speed one-inch magnetic tape system working at 90,000 digits per second or a standard system on half-inch tape working at 22,500 digits per second. Well, in the early 60s, the significant development was the integrated circuit. Thousands of transistors and other components, now microscopic in size, could be put on the surface of a single piece of silicon. Magnified, it looks like this. You can see the thousands of components. And with high enough magnification, we can see a single transistor. Since the early 70s, every year the capacity of chips has doubled and the cost halved. 
and backing store has developed from tape to disc. Each of these hard disks can hold at least 10 megabytes. A megabyte is a million characters, so 10 megabytes is just about one telephone directory. Some disks, of course, can hold up to 5,000 megabytes. Recently announced is this compact disk memory, which works on a modified form of the domestic compact disk player. But you can only read from this form of memory, not record. However, the latest backing store is this 12-inch double-sided laser disc on which you can both read and record. At the moment, though, you can't record over existing data. This holds two gigabytes. That's 2,000 million bytes. Or, if you like, 200 directories. The trouble is, it's still very slow in the computer's terms because it still depends on a mechanical system to find the data and transfer it to the main computer memory. Many of tomorrow's computer tasks, like speech recognition and so on, are going to need much faster processing with enormous amounts of memory which can be accessed directly. So the search is on for fast memory which can do justice to those super processors.